welcome. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. This is the Booms and Bus Show. My name is Jonathan Davis. And why are we listening to Land of Hope and Glory? Because on this week in history, in fact, in 1707, the first Parliament of Great Britain met. We, in effect, invented democracy. Yes, I know about the Greeks. I get that. But Magna Carta, just over 800 years ago, um, took away the, uh, the right of the king to do literally what he wanted to do. Um, and then eventually we got a parliament, we got the Bill of Rights, and uh, eventually, of course, we got um, um, widespread emancipation. Um, we got uh, men uh, over the age of 30 could vote, then 21, then women, then 21, then 18, and we have democracy. Is it the best system that there is? No doubt it is not, but it's the best of all the alternatives. Now, if, of course, we could have true democracy and uh, political parties where, for example, and this might throw you, were financed by government, by us, by you and me, as opposed to raising money themselves, yes, I think political parties should be financed by the state, by you and me, uh, and each individual constituency, um, the parties should receive the same amount of money to do with what they will. And uh, if you get uh, more than X percent votes in a national election, um, then you get more money and so on. And why? Because that would take money out of politics. If everyone was getting the same you wouldn't have, for example, the Tories um, uh, having uh, rolling over, having their tummies tickled by the crony capitalists. Similarly, you wouldn't have the socialists having their tummy tickled by the communists and the trade unions. So yes, I do actually believe it's appropriate that uh, political parties should be financed by the state. And do you remember a few years ago when they talked about this, I kept getting phoned up by the BBC asking my view, and I gave it, and they said, what, in this time of austerity, you want government to pay for political parties? And I said, that just shows you how little you understand. And I said that to so many producers and um, program bookers at the time, because they had been briefed that this is a bad thing. And they couldn't get it out of their head that it was anything other than that. All they could think about was government spending. Isn't it, isn't it curious? They think about government spending when it actually helps the governments and the political parties. But they don't think about government spending when um, it's about uh, helping the people. Funny that, isn't it? But yes, um, 1707. Um, the first parliament of Great Britain. And, uh, and that, of course, is now um, 310 years ago. And uh, unless and until we get out of that disgusting European Union, we're going to lose the democracy that we invented with Magna Carta over 800 years ago. And uh, I'm going to bring forward something I was going to be talking about later in the show. It's a letter in, by the look of it, I saw it on Twitter, uh, in a, 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 what do you call it, a tabloid newspaper. And the headline is Courage to Leave. And this was apparently written by a guy by the name of Trevor Collins, or else they made it up, who knows. Britain's exit from the EU is like a battered wife finally leaving her abusive husband. She worked hard and brought money into the household, but all he did was watch TV all day. 
money was squandered on his ne'er-do-well relatives who expected a handout. When she finally plucked up the courage to leave, he scoffed, You'll never make it without me. Yes, it would be hard for a time, but the freedom to plot her own course will see her through the bad times. I salute you, Mr. Collins, for writing about it in a language that we can all understand. So the Booms and Bus Show for new listeners is about free speech, free markets, capitalism, and I'm continually railing against the lies, the hypocrisy of socialism, communism, fascism, who are, of course, all coin, all, all sides of the same coin. And don't get me wrong, as far as I'm concerned, we don't have free speech. Huh, I wish, if only we did. And to give you an example of how the state not only views us, but treats us. You may well be aware that uh, Trump has released some more JFK files. There are some still, of course, hidden from public view for national security. For national security? An event which took place, what would that be, at 54 years? Uh, years ago, in November uh, 1963, uh, incidentally, today is Monday the 30th of October 2017. <laughs> 2016, 2017, and this is the weekly Booms and Bus show. And I see um, from one of the JFK files, and it's stamped. You'll see, all you have to do is go to the pinned tweet where it uh, shows um, the Booms and Bus show, this one you're listening to. So open that up, scroll down, and you'll see the charts and pictures that I'm looking at today. 3rd of October, 1955. And this was it stamped, microfilmed July 26, 1963. From the acting chief of station, which I imagine is a CIA, in Caracas to the chief of the WHD. What does that mean? White House Department? I don't know. It's classified top secret. And it says, Philip Citroen, former German SS trooper, stated to his confidentially, to him confidentially, that Adolf Hitler is still alive. Citroen claimed to have contacted Hitler about once a month in Colombia on his trip from Maracaibo to that country as an employee of the Royal Dutch Shipping Company. Um, he also stated that Hitler left Colombia for ja Argentina around January 1955. He was blown up in uh, his hideaway. Was he hell? They knew all along. Why didn't they tell us? Because no doubt it have cost them something, goodness knows what. But this is what we're up against. And the moment that we all lie down and have our tummies tickled and accept um, s relative financial security for our freedom is the day civilization ends. You think I'm exaggerating? I've mentioned it before, but just think of all the <clears throat> science fiction, dystopian future movies, TV series you've ever watched. And they all come about because we decide to allow our freedoms to be lost. Also, on this week in history, in fact, specifically, I've been away for a week. 
I was in North Wales um, on a short holiday for uh, half term um, uh, in the south of England and had an absolutely fantastic time. The weather was amazing. We were by the coast. It was just beautiful. I tell you what, if you don't know Wales, you are massively missing out. Go on Airbnb, an amazing invention by capitalists, which means that you don't have to go into um, boring hotels or uh, tiny little uh, bed and breakfasts. You can rent a whole house or an apartment for the cost of a couple of rooms. Why wouldn't you? You get a couple of bathrooms, you get a kitchen, you get a lounge as well as a couple of bedrooms. Why wouldn't you? Well done, Airbnb, a great capitalist invention. Cutting down the cost of holiday accommodation and raising the incomes of those who own the properties. A total win-win-win situation. My family, we've used Airbnb many times now, both for short breaks and for our long summer holidays. We love Airbnb. Uh, we love Wales, um, particularly Northwest Wales. Absolutely sensational. If you're bit walkers, there's lots of lovely hills around there. Snowdon, an amazing thing to climb. I heartily recommend it. The views are absolutely unbelievable. Unbeknownst to us, when we booked the apartment, um, it was actually the uh, one of the two apartments in the top floor of this very grand house um, in this relatively small town in northwest Wales. Turned out that the house was the frequent holiday home of 18th century Prime Minister William Gladstone. How interesting. Um, and it was sensational. Um, we had this huge lounge with literally 10 foot high ceilings in our flat. And um, uh, 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 at the end of the lounge were uh, four French windows which you opened onto this large veranda and you looked out onto the veranda, or indeed just through the French windows, and you saw the ocean or the Irish Sea. It was spectacular. Um, yeah, so, you know, check out North Wales. 19th of October, on this day in history, marked the 30th anniversary of the 1987 stock market crash. The Dow plunged 22.61% on the day, its biggest percentage drop ever, 508 points. <laughs> if it fell 508 points now, I'm just doing a quick calculation, that would be 2%, 2.2%. Um, that shows you how much the market has risen in the last 30 years the 22% fall that day is now hardly a blip on the long-term chart. And I'll tell you something else. Um, the crash in 1987 was the last financial crisis where the private markets were allowed to work. Since then, the Western governments, in this case the US government, as in the Federal Reserve, independent central bank, <laughs> if you believe that, I've got a bridge I can sell you. The government has turned market stability into an entitlement. I don't know when, but at some point, it's no longer going to be in control of the market. I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow. I'm not predicting that. In fact, I'm going to be talking in markets. Markets are doing fine, thank you very much. But at some point, the Federal Reserve is not going to be big enough to control the markets. What's happening? My God, Catalonia is one of the greatest things that I've seen in all my years. Brexit vote was great. The Trump vote was great. 
But what the guys are doing in Catalonia, and when I say the guys, I don't mean the political leaders. I mean the people of northeast Spain. What they're doing is some is nothing short of absolutely sensational. And, you know, the way the Spanish government and the EU, the hypocritical two-faced EU, it's in their rules and regulations, it's right at the top of the tree. You cannot abuse the human rights and the democratic rights of the people and be a member of the EU. And what have we heard from the EU? And I quote, unquote, that's what we've heard from the EU. We've all seen the video clips of the police and army brutality of people Listen, listener, in in the Western world, in the first world, in Europe, the people were trying to vote. This is unbelievable. And yet, given all that I've seen, read and heard, over the last 25 years that I've become semi-conscious to what's going on, it's not unbelievable at all. In fact, it's blooming inevitable. Um, it does seem to me that um, there's not going to be huge bloodshed there. But if the Catalonians act, continue to act correctly, should I say, then there is going to be a Gandhi-esque revolution. I truly wish them well. I hope they succeed. Um, I, I was on the radio with a, a crowd called Sputnik UK, which is funded by Putin and his, uh, his cronies. However, that's by the by. Um, and they asked me, um, do, do I believe that Brexit um, influenced this? And I said, I doubt it very much. But if it did all power to it. Uh, on the contrary, anyone who knows anything at all about Spanish history knows that um, it's a, a grouping of, of satellites by Franco, which should never have happened in the first place, and the Catalonians and the Basques were the most likely to try to secede um, more than anyone else in uh, Europe, apart from perhaps the Northern Irish. Um, worryingly, um, I've seen um, informed and reasonable people tweet um, that the leaders of the Catalonian um, secessionists um, are socialists, anti-Semites, pro-Muslims, just like socialists and fascists everywhere. So it's pretty clear that if Catalonians do succeed in seceding, they'll simply go into the arms of the EU anyway. Nothing actually will change except that the political leaders will get big jobs. So what's new? Just like um, the, uh, the SNP and uh, the people who want Scotland to leave the United Kingdom. Uh, and on that point, uh, I think I have said it um, uh, um, early on this year uh, in the Booms and Bus show, I am pro-Scotland leaving the United Kingdom, but only on the basis that Scotland doesn't then join the EU. If it does, then absolutely nothing's changed. In fact, it'll be even worse for Scotland but that doesn't enter the heads of the uh, the Skexeters. Talking of which, and leading me back to Brexit, um, you know, question arose on Twitter um, this weekend. Absolutely brilliant and simple question. How many people were frightened by Project Fear into voting Remain? No one's ever asked that question. It's only people were frightened into voting leave. 
which is not at all the case. But how many were frightened by Project Fear? And of course, um, nearly all of Project Fear's predictions have been proven to be absolutely false. <laughs> so I see the Tories have produced a document with over 30 Tory MPs allegedly engaged in sexual misconduct. Um, I, I, I'm, I, yet again, I'm reminded of... Um, uh, I've forgotten the, the captain's name... Um, saying to Rick in Casablanca, I am shocked, Rick, that there's gambling going on in this casino. Captain Renault. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, anything from the other parties? Total silence. The leader of the Labour Party says, we must do something in his... Lovely, quiet tone. He's such a nice man, isn't he? Jeremy Corbyn. Privately educated. Grew up in a huge um, uh, inherited estate. His brother's peers. Pierce Corbyn. He's Jeremy Corbyn. Privately educated. Came out, I think, with a third class honours in his degree. Only ever did, if he did any work at all, it was um, in the public sector. The guy's got no idea about what the world is about. He's been 38 years now an MP in Islington. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like um, it, 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 it's it, it's like there is no competition for any other political party. He cannot be moved. He's like a tenured academic professor. You can't move the guy. Thus, he can say and think whatever he wants. Now, that in itself is fine, but he doesn't think. And as far as I'm concerned, he's incapable of thinking. He's as thick as two short planks. Corbyn says we must do something. So what does he do? Nothing. And he continues to be silent over any victim of the Rotherham mass Islamic grooming, raping, etc., of our daughters, 1,400 of them. Where are the prosecutions? Weinstein, Spacey, so what's new? Hollywood and the whole lefty crap. It's disgusting. And they go after Trump and free speech? As Private Fraser would say in Dad's Army, We're doomed, I tell you! We're doomed! I'm serious. We're doomed. I could think of another word for it, but you get my point. One of Trump's advisers, Roger Stone, has had his Twitter account suspended because he... Um, he criticised a few CNN uh, senior um, broadcasters. I'm delighted to report, as is reported on Twitter, he will sue Twitter. Yay! Someone's finally going for them. I hope he gets something. And I hope it starts to make Twitter realise what the hell they're doing. I should point out, that uh, shares in Twitter are stupid cheap and they might be a fantastic investment for the long term. But that is different to Twitter um, and its amorals. Have you subscribed to the Booms and Bus Report yet? No? Well, I think you should. And what you'll get is um, is really... Excellent uh, meat and to, to put on the bones of what I talk about here. Um, I'm told it's a good read and I'm told it's useful. It comes out every couple of months. Um, you should be on the Booms and Brush Support to get it. Just 
send to jd at the booms and bus show.com your email address and I'll put you on the list. You'll never be junk mailed. Your email will never leave this office. I'd appreciate it um, if when you're uh, on the Twitter account, you're looking at the pinned tweet and you're scrolling down, when you see the tweet to star rate the podcast on iTunes, I'd really love it if you would do that. It'll help get the message out that this show is here and um, it might attract other people who wouldn't normally uh, know about this. Moving on to economics, 25 minutes. Crisis or stagnation, why China cannot deleverage? The latest figures of the Chinese economy show a third quarter GDP growth of 6.8%, suspiciously in line with the government mandate and consensus estimates. However, it's not the top line that worries me. It is the evidence of debt saturation and diminishing returns of the centrally planned model, aka communism. Chinese total debt has surpassed 300%. In the first nine months of the year, money supply has increased by over 9%, significantly above earlier years, early year estimates. China has added more debt in the first nine months of 2017, get this, than the US, the EU, and Japan combined. <laughs> that is just so ridiculous. That shows you how they're having to create more and more money just basically to stand still. According to the FT, zombie firms have soared as growth fails to catch up on debt and interest increases. The central government's legion of zombie firms, as defined by those unable to cover the interest expense with their operating profits, is now comprised of over 2,000 large companies with assets of around 450 billion US dollars. Can you imagine what would happen to the extremely low returns if growth was reduced to a more sustainable 4%? We dream of 4% annual GDP growth. It would be a complete collapse of the Chinese economy. This is one of the reasons why, despite public messages suggesting the opposite, the government cannot and will not put deleverage as a priority. According to UBS and the FT, China requires 6.5 units of capital to create one unit of GDP growth, double the ratio a decade ago. China has few options. Most of these imbalances and liabilities are financed in local currency with local banks, and the government could devalue the currency drastically. But that would hurt its economic growth, sending a questionably low inflation, also estimated to be three times higher than the officials say, to socially unacceptable levels. In other words, it would make inflation soar. China can endure the end of its vicious circle of poor capital allocation, high debt and rising imbalances through stagnation, avoiding a social collapse and massively increasing public debt. But that's all it can do. If it wants to avoid a giant financial crisis that would clean the system and resume sustainable growth, but at the same time create significant social challenges, it will have to accept high debt, zombified stagnation, 
the way that Europe, Brazil or Japan ended. There is no magic solution that will sort these enormous imbalances while delivering world-leading growth. That is an abridged version of a piece by Daniel Lacalle, who is the chief economist at Tracy. Essentially what he's saying there is, China just prints and prints and prints, as we've known for years, and yes, I have for years been saying we've got to invest in China and everything around it, like One Belt, One Road, which is now being called the Belt and Road Initiative. Don't question it. But do not believe for one moment that it's capitalism or anything remotely like capitalism. Socialism is based on printing money. How do you think you got Weimar hyperinflation, Venezuela hyperinflation, Zimbabwe hyperinflation? And that is what's going to happen to Japan, who's had nearly 30 years of deflation. They're going to move to hyperinflation. Believe it. Japan, which was the second largest economy on the planet, is going to move to hyperinflation in the next few or several years. As uh, Ernest Hemingway said, um, I went bankrupt so slowly, then quickly. Inflation starts slowly. A couple of years ago, we had 0%. We've now got 3 or 4%. It starts slowly. It's imperceptible. But eventually it picks up and then goes exponential. China... Um, will continue to do what it does and we will continue to make money from it but do not for one moment believe that China is okay forever. It will have crashes, I don't know when, and they will be huge crashes. Um, and at some point it might clear out the rubbish in the system as capitalism should but unlikely because they don't have a capitalist system. I notice that um, in the um, in the uh, the five year conference China just had of the Communist Party, they have made President Xi the um, all powerful. Um, he can never be ousted now, never, um, and he's in fact more powerful than Chairman Mao or Deng Xiaoping. He is more powerful now in the hundredth year of communism than Deng Xiaoping or Chairman Mao. This is communism, folks. Do not for one moment believe that communism works. Because, to give you one example, China are this close to um, finalising the development of um, a public camera system which will recognise and identify every individual that comes in camera shot within three seconds. And if you tell me that that's to do with trade, I've got another bridge I can sell you. I mentioned Japan there going into hyperinflation. Well, as everyone knows, they've been printing money hand over fist now for 20, 25 years. And indeed, they've been ramping it up in the last several years. And uh, the main culprit of that is the Prime Minister, um, Prime Minister Abe, um, who essentially, you know, he created Abenomics, print, 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 baby, print. And his lead partner in crime is uh, the governor of the Bank of Japan, Haruhiko Kuroda, Kur Kuroda, I beg your pardon, um, who just prints ad infinitum. And the bad news is that Abe and his party have just been re-elected to be Prime Minister and to re lead on a two-thirds supermajority. They can now do whatever the hell they want. There is no opposition now. The people have spoken. They have spoken to benefit themselves and to hell to their Gen uh, next generations. And uh, Abe has uh, 
um, ha, uh, it's reported that he is likely to remain, uh, that Corrodo, I beg your pardon, is likely to remain in post for, quote, another five years, unquote. This is the reason why Japan has gone from 0% inflation to not much, 1% or 2% inflation, and it's likely to go to hyperinflation within five years. Do you know what? It's possible. That's how ridiculous it is. And um, I, I will remember, I'll never forget, uh, reading um, a, a, a report by uh, Societe Generale's uh, Albert Edwards, who some of you may know. He is Mr. Uber Bear, Mr. Ice Age, he calls himself. Um, apparently, we're still in the Ice Age and it's still deflation and whatever. But he wrote, I think back in 2010 or something like that, he wrote about Japan and their finances, their government finances, they just literally don't have enough money and they will never have enough money to pay all the social promises. Thus, they will just print and print and print. So whether it's Abe or Kuroda or the next crowd, they will just print and print and print. And yes, there is an argument for saying that the Japanese Nikkei index um, which currently stands at some 20-something thousand, I can't remember off the top of my head, it could go to a million within several years. Think about that. And if you could capture those gains um, inflation-adjusted, you'd be as wealthy as Croesus. Talking about inflation interest rates, there's an interesting chart um, showing um, about 200 years of Bank of England uh, interest rates. What do you believe, before looking at the chart, what do you believe is the average interest rate of the Bank of England for the last 200 years? Do you believe that it's um, um, 4%? 8% or 12%? I'll give you five seconds. Ding! The average interest rate over the last 200 years of the Bank of England is 4.65%. And what have we had now for nearly a decade? A half percent or a quarter of a percent. And the average is over 4.5%. That's how ridiculous the crooks, um, um, Mark Carney and his predecessor, the guy with the round glasses, Mervyn King, that's how crooked these guys are. So where are uh, uh, interest rates going? Well, they're going up. They're going up and up and up but they're going up behind the rate of inflation. So inflation's already at 3 or 4%. Interest rates are still at quarter percent. Do you know what? They could go to a half percent by next week. Next week, the Monetary Policy Committee gets together. Could go to a half percent. And um, 48 out of 58 economists surveyed by Bloomberg say that they will do so. The market... Um, for futures is pricing in an 88% probability. Basically, interest rates are very likely going up next week. And interest rates will rise and rise and rise, um, slowly but surely. And they will always rise behind rising inflation. So inflation will rise quicker than interest rates. Eventually, at some point, interest rates will get so higher, so high and um, it'll be the proverbial snowflake. Uh, who created the avalanche? The unstable system or the last snowflake? Who knows? Um, UK CPI is 3%. Unemployment of 42-year low. Record low central bank rate. Record low. That's like forever, guys. And ever was a long time of 0.25%. None of it makes sense. It hasn't made sense for years. They're crooks, pure and simple. They are crooks. 
Um, the US is probably raising interest rates again within the next few weeks. That means they'll have gone from 0 to 1.25%. Where are they headed? Higher. And higher and higher. The thing is, um, it depends how the media plays it. If the media says it's the end of the world as we know it, you can pretty well expect a house price crash because there'll be a flood of properties coming to the market for sale. If, however, the media basically says, hey, there's nothing to worry about, it's only a quarter percent, and so on and so on, you know, the usual lies, then don't expect a house price crash. But as interest rates rise and rise and rise, well, you know what will happen to the economy and to asset prices. This is interesting. Big picture. The top three most common ages in America back in 2010 were 45, 46 and 53. In other words, middle age. Seven years later, the top three most common ages in America are now 25, 26 and 27. Youngsters who are desperate to make their way in the world. And they are the most voluminous in America. That's positive for America, folks. That's great demographics. So, you know, all is not lost. And and I've always been at pains to say that on this show. Um, I'm not one of your doomsters and gloomsters and all the rest of it. This is the booms and busts show. It looks like Trump will decide the new Fed chairman this week. This week. Week commencing the 30th of October 2017. Remember, Trump is a property guy. He loves low interest rates and easy lending. We know nothing till it's announced. My bet is whoever, whomever promised him the lowest rates and continuation of bailouts will win the job. This is why, and this will surprise you, Jimmy Carter was one of the greatest US presidents. Without a shadow of a doubt, he appointed Volcker, who took rates up to previously unknown levels and cut out the crap from the financial system that Nixon had allowed. Unfortunately, Reagan then messed it up, although, um, to his credit, <clears throat> he did have Volcker for a second term. And, of course, Reagan's successor continued the, um, the messing up and making it even worse. It was worse than Clinton. It was even worse with um, uh, George W. Bush. And it was the worst of all time with Barack Obama. Markets. <clears throat> There's an interesting chart of S&P 500 sector earnings growth um, for um, quarter three, 2017. And uh, it shows energy up 110%. No doubt in line with a dramatically rising oil price that I've been talking about for the last few months and to my clients for the last year and a half and to those who read the Booms and Bus report, but also because the energy companies were so hammered. A little nudge from extremely bad can actually turn extremely bad into good in terms of relative to what was before, the marginal change. So energy companies continuing to benefit in their earnings. And do you think that will also continue to benefit their share prices? Huh. <laughs> Are you in global energy stocks, folks? Why the hell not? Gold. Interesting, eh? 1360, 1260, where are we going now? 1310, question mark, still up in the air. Um, it feels as if it needs a bounce to about 1310. Um, 
But there are only a few mild positives. But there are many major negatives still in potentially an ongoing bear market. If it gets above 1315, you're looking at 1360, which would be a retest of the summer 2016 high and indeed the September 2017 high. Um, note, however, with the September 2017 high, gold went up, but miners didn't much. And, um, well, if you get above 1360 and above 1370, well, you know what? You're, you're uh, exceeding this summer 2016 high, and then you're probably looking at 1550 to 1700. A massive bull market. Um, however... If it fails at 13.10, and that's assuming you even get this mini rally from 12.60 to 12.70. I mean, as I speak at uh, uh, 2.06 in the afternoon of Monday the 30th, um, gold um, is, I'm just typing it in, as I speak, it's um, 12.73. Um, it had a nice move. No, that's on the hourly. Change that to the daily. It had a quite a nice move on Friday, which interesting suggests a, a double bottom at about twelve sixty, um, as it did in early October. Um, we could be looking at a rally now, uh, and certainly according to the uh, the Fibonacci retracements, then yes, it was a 62% retracement at 1260. If you don't know Fibonacci's, don't worry about it. You can look it up on Google. You can watch videos and so on. But certainly the 62% retracement was at 1263, and uh, that's basically where we got to. So yes, we could be looking at a, th a retest. However... If it fails here, you're looking at sub-1200. And it remains to be still about the dollar-yen. Uh, as the yen strengthens against the dollar, you see strength in gold, silver, and miners. And uh, as we speak, the yen uh, was strong on Friday. It's strong today. Um, it's 113.4. Uh, if it were to break... Uh, 112.9, yes, you're probably looking at uh, something of a rally in gold, but it would have to, it would have to break uh, 112 convincingly for us to see a, a very major uh, bull market. You'd have to see that. You can see that on the charts. Now, they call it the market madness. It continues. Global stocks gained another 2,000 billion dollars in market cap last week they've now jumped over 90 trillion dollars following a dovish ECB statement and more to the point blowout earnings of the likes of um, Amazon um, Google as in Alphabet and uh, Microsoft I don't call it madness at all. I call it zero interest rates. I call it easy money. I call it liquidity. And I call it um, earnings are blowing out. In other words, it's entirely rational that the stock market continues on all-time highs. Look at the chart of the Bloomberg World Stock Market Capitalization. It's way above where it was in 2017, when it got just above 60 trillion. It's now 50% above the peak in 2017. The only negative I can see on that chart is that it's turning into an Eiffel Tower and uh, it's gone exponential. That, in the short term, is not necessarily an issue. But some months down the line, you might find that suddenly there are just no more new buyers. What could possibly stop that chart from just rising and rising and rising? Well, you know, I said before on the show, it's likely to be something that we're not looking at. It may be um, that we get 
too quick tightening, i.e. higher rates too quickly. But that has still got some way to go. It's got to be at least another six months. And indeed, from the 1st of November, which is of course in two days' time, we enter the stronger six months of the stock market year. And the thing to note about all this is that the rest of the world is doing much better than the US for the first time in years. I've talked many times about emerging markets, but developed markets outside of the US are doing better than the US as well. Do you only invest where it has been good? No, you invest where it has been bad and there is now a good story. US natural gas looks hot to trot, given how hated it is. And incidentally, um, looking at the buys that someone made in the last hour of the New York market on Friday. Huge. Someone knows something, folks. Someone knows something. And looking at a couple of um, natural gas stocks like um, Southwest Energy and um, what's that other one called? Gulfport. Um, they, they were both up um, 4 or 5% on Friday. Something's afoot. Don't know what it is, but something's afoot. Couple of quotes of the week. Um, it's not really a quote, it's a saying. If you're not a socialist at 17, you have no heart. If you're still a socialist at 37, you have no brain. You know, listener, there are only two reasons why people are socialists at the age of 40. Either one, they're making money from it, or two, <laughs> they're incredibly stupid. Ayn Rand, Atlas Shrugged, great, great woman, Russian emigre, great, great person. Quote, There is no difference between communism and socialism except in the means of achieving the same ultimate end. Communism proposes to enslave men by force. Socialism by vote. It is merely the difference between murder and suicide. Unquote. And on that sensational note, I will wish you an amazing week and I will see you next week.